All right, good afternoon, everybody. <clears throat> uh, my name is Chris. I'm your host for the webinar today. Welcome to the first ISTRAC T South Africa Tech Talk for 2022. Um, further to the popularity of Professor Alvin's talk on failure analysis last year, we're extending it to a part two and a part three. Uh, today we'll be doing part three, uh, part two rather, sorry, and next month, um, Emmanuel from the Steel Institute will be handling part three. Um, for those of you who don't know Prof Alban, uh, a short introduction. Um, he's a structural engineering professor at the University of Witwatersrand. Rand. Uh, he has a PhD and master's degree from MIT, so very smart man. Um, in terms of his academic work, he, um, his expertise lie in finite elements and analysis and discrete element modeling. Um, and he has an interest in instrumentation and sensor works, um, trying to match measurements with computer simulations. Um, as a practicing engineer, provides consulting services to the industry and is a director of Aura Entle PTY Limited, who are um, a bit of a startup uh, slab manufacturer, designer, installer. Um, <clears throat> Uh, to, to, to give a bit of background to the talk, in case you missed the first one, um, Alex will go through some concepts around failure analysis, looking at failure itself, what is failure, collapse, and rational design. Um, and he's going to try to give us a bit more insight into the differences between the design process versus failure analysis. Um, Alex, I'll hand over to you now. Um, thank you very much, and we'll do a Q&A at the end of the session. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Chris. So today's talk will be uh, an elaboration uh, and a continuation of the talk we gave uh, a few months back. It's on failure analysis uh, versus collapse versus design process. And if you have any questions, please feel free to uh, ask them or put up your hands. In fact, let me see if I can um, see a side panel for chat. And I can, yeah, we go. All right, so if anybody wants to ask questions, please go ahead and ask. All right, so we start off with a concept overview and the first few slides I'm gonna go through relatively quickly because we have covered them in the past. Most people, when they think of uh, uh, failure, they have in their minds the term collapse. The term collapse in their mind is definitely a failure. But there are many other failures, as we will see today, that are not involving collapse. Now, against failure and against collapse stands the modern engineering method of design, which we call rational design. So the term rational design is a concept of that we sit and we think, we think about uh, our structure, we put pen to paper, or well, nowadays we tap along or click along on the computer, and that is a form of rational design that we use our minds in order to prevent failure, in order to prevent collapse. We'll show you a few examples of failure, which will be most unimpressive, and one or so example of collapse. Right. So the first question that we asked last time, who knows what a failure is? And the second question is, what's the difference between collapse and failure? I think I'm not going to uh, wait for answers here. We'll simply give you the answers as the talk progresses. But last time we had some interesting answers about what is failure and what is collapse. So when we think of collapse, this is a collapse of the temporary works on the M1 where there were unfortunate uh, um, deaths, where the temporary works fell over and we call this, and everybody understands that this is collapse. This is very obvious. Collapses are clearly identifiable. You can have a global collapse, you can have a local collapse, but whichever way it is, the structure is clearly fallen over. We say that this has collapsed and definitely we say that this has failed. 
Right, so the answer to the first question, it's difficult to determine when the structure has failed. The reason why it's difficult to determine is because, prop, the slides are not moving along on my screen. Am I sharing my screen? Sorry. Uh, yeah, sorry, Alex, we see a screen, it's just we can't see the slides. Huh. Okay, let's stop sharing and let's restart our share. Please tell me if you can see them now. Okay, I'll tell you now. Um, can you see them now? Just hold on, it's busy loading. At the moment, there's just a blank screen. Yeah, I can, I can only see a black screen. There's nothing, nothing on it. All right, let's see. Can you see this? Just one sec. Okay. Can you see that? Um, yeah, I can see it now. Can you see that? Yeah. So unfortunately, yes. there's something wrong with uh, compatibility and technology. We'll have to do it um, basically on here. Can, can everybody see this? In fact, I'm just going to do that. Can everybody see that? Yes, it reads failure analysis versus the design process. All right. So let's try and make this, in fact, as big as possible. And uh, let's try and move this off. Right. Okay. I've tried to maximize my screen. Let's, let's start again then. Right. So I wanted to show you this photograph uh, where clearly a collapse has occurred, where the temporary works have fallen over uh, onto the M1, unfortunate, an unfortunate accident, an unfortunate uh, structural collapse. And you can see here that there is gross movement and there's no question that the structure has collapsed. And we can say that it has also failed, but fundamentally everybody understands that this structure has collapsed. The collapse here is global in nature. If a portion of the structure were to collapse, you would say it's local, local uh, collapse. So failure is much more subtle. It's difficult to determine. It's very subtle and not obvious. It's mostly invisible to the human eye and it needs careful measurements, observations and instrumentation. So who's competent to determine if failure has occurred? There are two groups of people. First, it's the structural engineer. And second of all, it's the client. Remember that we are talking about failure now and not collapse. There are two types of failures. The first one is in service, what I call serviceability limit state or serviceability failure. And the second one is a strength failure or an ultimate limit state failure. Now at this point you can say, but prof, but prof, ultimate limit state failure or strength failure is gonna lead to collapse. Well, today I'm hoping to disabuse you of that assumption. Both these failures could be, both these failures could be obvious, but both these failures are oftentimes invisible to the human eye. And one has to be very um, attuned and very aware in order to determine these types of failures. And I'm going to show you a few of these. So the first failure that I would like to show you is in my bathroom upstairs. And if you look carefully, you can see a very small crack, relatively small. It is a crack. And in fact, the crack has opened to such an extent that we have a broken pipe underneath and the pipe is now leaking. So this is an example of a serviceability failure where the loading on the structure has caused a crack which is non-structural in nature. It is non-structural in nature. So this is an example of a serviceability uh, failure. Other serviceability failures would be visible deflection or deflection that you feel when you walk on the structure or interact with the structure. Another one would be vibration. Another one would be fatigue. And the one uh, item that really gives us a hint that there is a serviceability, a structural serviceability limit state problem is that the structure requires 
constant maintenance or periodic maintenance. It requires repeated, repeated repair. And these are expensive fixes. So for example, in my own house upstairs, I would have to replace all these tiles and make sure that this crack does not appear again, or I can handle it in a different way by introducing a joint. This is a serviceability crack, right? Serviceability failure. He has an ultimate limit state failure, which is my neighbor's house that I can photograph from upstairs. And if you look very carefully here, I don't know if you can see this, but there is a little subtle displacement of the tiles on the neighbor's roof. Well, this is clearly a truss or a timber truss or a rafter problem. And the rafters slash truss have most probably lost stability and have been unbraced. And this is considered an ultimate limit state failure, an ultimate, ultimate limit state failure, where there could be structural cracks, classification and yielding, loss of stability, as you see here. And this could be local or global. This is most probably local. Local a loss of stability is also known as buckling. And in the worst case scenario, this might or might not collapse. But in the worst case scenario, this would re uh, lead to collapse. So what we can see here is that both serviceability and ultimate limit state failures can be set, while the ultimate limit state failures could lead to a collapse. Serviceability limit state failures really lead to anything but a expensive fix. So here are other examples of failures, serviceability limit state now, which now is so gross, so uh, large that it leads to ultimate limit state failure or might lead to an ultimate limit state failure. And I'll give you two examples. Here's a photograph courtesy of Spencer Erling, where we have this crawl beam that is supported and the portal frames, none of them are braced. You can see them here. And what has happened is this has simply lost stability or buckle. There is no bracing in the system and it is so gross, the whole thing is now in gross deformation and the loads are no longer, um, can be computed with simple linear elastic and that small deformation analysis. Here's another example of large deflections. So this is the commonly used ribbon block system for a suspended slab. Unfortunately, they installed this rib upside down. So this would constitute a failure in and of itself. But look how gross deformation, what has happened either because the system has been under design or because they removed the props too early. So it has sagged to such a significant um, degree that the, I would assume the owners worried and they installed this steel beam. Now, from an engineering perspective, I believe there is no purpose in this steel beam. There's no purpose. So this is an example of the client throwing good money off the bad. Serviceability limit states, if they are very large, could lead to ultimate limit states, which could then lead to collapse. So we need to understand that there are different types, that there are different types of failures, and the different types of failures have different repercussions. Right. So what stands in the way of these serviceability limit failures and in the way of ultimate limit state failures, that is the modern method of design. So that is what stands in the way. And we use the rational design, as I explained, in order to prevent us from having large displacements from, um, in order for us to prevent us from having the material breaking or the whole system falling over. And modern method of design, which is the rational design, uses experience, which is a historical uh, log of what has happened and what has worked in the past. We use building standards and building codes, which embody this experience. And then we do some analysis and modeling, either by hand or nowadays using computer software. And all this gets embodied in drawings. This is the flow, the philosophy behind design, modern design, and the product of modern design, of course, are drawings and specifications. So the experience, which is this first part, is often replaced by computer software. So let us see. This is a fire escape. This is a fire escape. 
and it is embraced in this direction. It is embraced in this, sorry, in this direction. I hope you can see my cursor. It is embraced in this direction. In this direction, it's got this um, uh, small bracing, and then it is leaning on this shear wall. Well, clearly this is the weak axis of the I-beams and in the weak direction, i.e. in this direction, the system is unbraced. Has this passed rational design? The answer is no, it has not passed rational design. There's no bracing in this plane of the frame, the multi-floor frame. So it has not passed rational design. But hang on, hang on, why hasn't it fallen over? It hasn't fallen over because, well, it hasn't fallen over. The structure doesn't have to fall over for it not to pass rational design. However, if it were to fall over and there were a legal case, the structural engineer, the PR engineer, will find it very difficult to explain why there's been no bracing in this plane. Now, he might or she might come up with a different explanation of how they braced this plane, but on the surface, it doesn't seem like there is any bracing in this direction. So has the structure failed? The answer is absolutely it has failed. Where has it failed? It has failed at the design stage. It has failed when the drawings were produced. As soon as the drawings were produced of this structure, assuming that this structure did follow the drawings, then this structure has failed at the design stage. It does not pass rational design. He has another example, a case, a legal case I was involved with many years ago. Here we've got a main column and we have this interesting type of haunch, which is non-standard, connecting into the web of this major column. And this is a um, beam. It's a very sophisticated beam, in fact, and it's got many, many stiffness. But the question is, does this pass rational design? The answer, no, it also doesn't pass rational design. Why? Because A, it used a non-standard connection, non-standard haunch, and it connected it into the web. So in this plane, in this plane, what is causing, what is having, what is giving us stability? The answer is nothing. The answer is nothing. And therefore, this has also failed already at the uh, inception at the drawing or rational design stage, it has failed. It so turns out that the design engineer also introduced many notches and many stress concentrators. And this was one of the rare cases where a steel beam, a massive steel beam cracked. You could see the crack visibly, it was about hundred millimeters long in the tension part of the um, uh, beam due to vibration or machine loading from above. So not only has it failed on the not using standard connections and not connecting it in a moment type of frame, so stability is called into question, it also failed serviceability failure as it happens uh, in terms of fatigue. Let me see if I've got a question. Right, somebody says yes, much better. All right, excellent. So now please feel free to ask your questions and we will try and address them as we're going along. Right, so whose fault is it anyway? I'm not gonna get into the details. We covered them um, last time, but basically the various parties could be to blame, the structural engineer, the contractor, even the owner and the client could be to blame, the administrator slash project manager could be to blame, or all of them could be blamed as uh, in a case I'm involved with right now. In case people don't understand, the owner and the client could be involved if they use slash abuse the structure or misuse the structure in ways that were not specified to the structural designer at the design stage. So overloading can occur, but if it is significant overloading, the client, the intelligent client should come back and ask the structural designer whether they can or cannot uh, load in a specific way, or if the use of the structure changes in a different way, their old structure. Lack of poor maintenance, and if the owner does not demand accountability from his professional team here, who does not supervise the contractor. So this is a very complicated 
could become a very complicated uh, flow chart. Uh, the fault attribution, every single party will, uh, will point a finger at everybody but themselves. All right. And then, of course, there is the act of God. The act of God has been recently blamed for most failures, when in reality, the act of God, acts of God are very, very rare, and they are mostly attributed, can be attributed to one of these people over here. All right. So we have explained to you um, the difference between, sorry, we have explained to you uh, serviceability, limit state failures, and ultimate limit state failures. Now, I just want to touch lightly on the difference between why something fails, the reason for failure, and the cause of failure. So structural engineers design and build to code and use rational design can save built structures using rational design. So when we come out to inspect, we can say this structure complies to my drawings, it doesn't comply to my drawings, it doesn't comply to my drawings, is it going to be still okay or won't it be okay? This is, uh, if this is followed, then structures should not fail. However, we as structural engineers are not trained or equipped to determine root cause of failure. I know that there are some talks being given to explain root cause of failure, and I, I have attended, while not the code, what I saw um, online recently, but different ones, and they try to explain, and in many legal cases, uh, my opposition tries to explain that the structure fails, and what they mean by fail is actually collapse, but anyway, that it fails because, well, it hasn't followed code, that it violates code in clause such and such and such and such, and I try to explain to them that structures behave in a different way, and we as structural engineers are not equipped to understand why a structure fails. We are equipped to design a structure not to fail, but when a structure fails, it is not necessarily that the structure does or does not follow the code. In order to determine why a structure uh, failed, we need to do uh, sensor monitoring, instrumentation, measurements, and then forensic engineering, which most of us are not um, educated to perform and then do something called failure analysis. This has got nothing to do with codes, building codes, building standard violation, violation structures, follow laws of physics. We structural engineers follow codes, the code and the, um, um, uh, and the regulations are not, are not necessarily obeying the laws of physics. All right. And here I've got a funny statement that structures do not read nor obey building codes. That is obvious. They obey the laws of nature, which we have modeled as humans by the laws of physics. All right. So to prove a few points, I hope, or maybe not, I have performed several experiments that we will document in an upcoming paper. So the title of this section is, but it works, strength considerations. So oftentimes I come out to site and the engineer on site and the builders on site and the erectors say, but it works, look, look, it's working. And I say, how do you know? They say, because it's standing, it's clear that it works strength considerations. There will, of course, be other considerations, but the first one will be strength considerations. So in this section, I'm going to give you a simply supported beam, which is loaded by what's called a waffle tree. Anyway, there's a point load that is spread into two point loads. Here is the load spreader. It is loaded at two points into what's called four point bending. That does not matter. What matters is that we give you three different beams, beam one, beam two, beam three. It is identified as beam one, beam two, beam three. And I know what constitutes beam one, beam two, beam three. They are all loaded in the same fashion in a um, server hydraulic machine, and they are supported in an identical way, and they all look identical. They are almost all identical. So if I ask you which beam of these works, and I use the work, uh, word works, but it works from here. I don't think a single one of you will be able to tell me. Should I hold a pole? Who can tell me 
which of these beams is going to fail? Or perhaps that is a wrong question. Can I have some feedback to see who can tell me by typing on your um, a chat, tell me who thinks they know which beam has failed. And if you know, tell me, how do you know it has failed? Where it has failed, why it has failed? Right, let's read along. So, okay. Jabula uh, Zimba, direct message. Ah, it fell off. Beam four. Yes, much better. Beam four, that's very cool. It fell off. Somebody's laughing. Impossible to tell visually. Impossible to tell visually. Beam three, somebody writes. Beam two, somebody writes. Three looks like uh, concrete that will crack. Excellent. And then forensic engineer will know. And then beam three seems to have cracking at the bottom fibers. All right. So last time I presented this and uh, one of the participants, I will name no names, said, but Prof, your photographs are rubbish. Sorry for the rubbish photographs. All right, here we go. So to answer the questions on the slide, there's no way to tell by visual inspection which one of these is going to fail or has failed. The safest is to say, we don't know, and we will not jump to any conclusions because we don't know. It turns out that all these beams are uncracked. So the people say, saying that this looks like it has failed at the bottom, blah, blah. That is not correct. All these beams are pristine in the sense of they were cast, demolded, and placed into the loading rig. Here you see them, and we will show you a few slides that will record the performance under load. So we do not know whether these have failed or will fail. So we will start off with beam number one. All right, so let's go to beam number one and see what we've got. So here we have the picture of beam number one. I will give you more information that it is balance reinforced. In other words, we apply the load and we use the modern South African codes to determine how much reinforcement is required and all the reinforcement that has been supplied is to code. We load and we measure the deflection of the load point and we plot the load versus the displacement of the load. And the picture is taken where this black circle is. So in other words, at the unloaded stage. So we see here, that the load picks up almost linearly, reaches some kind of yield point, and then starts to fall off. So here, with this extra information of how it is reinforced, balance reinforced, the original picture upon, just upon loading, the force displacement graph, if I were to ask you, where has the beam one failed? Or has it failed? And where are the rational design loads? Can anybody answer, say, the easier question, where has been one failed? Has it failed here? Here, at what load has it failed? Can anybody tell me, or somebody tell me in chat? Seventy kilonewtons. Seventy kilonewtons. Anybody else? So it has failed at 70 kilonewtons, 75 kilonewtons, that's about here. Hasn't failed, hasn't failed. Deflection more than one over 250. Does concrete actually, when you do concrete design, do you ever calculate the deflection? When it exceeds the serviceability limit state deflection. All right, anybody else? Come on guys. We've got a force deflection with forces quite clearly written and deflections quite clearly written. Ah, it's not an easy answer. Where has beam one failed or has it failed? All right, so let's investigate the answers to that. Let's see if I can do this. Sorry. Sorry, I have lost my cursor. Page down. 
Right. Let me give you a bit more information first. Upon, so let's repeat. So we've got a force deflection graph to here, and then we unload the load. And not to be surprised, it rebounds elastically and has a permanent deflection of 10 millimeters. 10 millimeter deflection. Is that more information to tell us where has the beam failed? Can you reply where it has failed? Any more information that you can use? Nobody's writing. All right. Let's look at the next graph. Here is the design calculation of ultimate limit state loads and serviceability limit state loads. Now, I need to point out something to you in case you have not picked this up. The beam does not read the code. The beam behaves and obeys the laws of nature or laws of physics, if you like. We now have and work backwards to determine our serviceability loads and our ultimate limit state loads. These two lines were used to determine the reinforcement. Can you see it? Now I'm going backwards as it were. So you're going backwards, and then the behavior of the beam is matched. Now, when you were lectured and taught engineering, you must probably be told serviceability limit state amplified by the partial load factors, ultimate limit state loads, apply material factors to your materials and provide enough material to hold these loads. Well, here we went the opposite loop. We showed you the real behavior. This is the synthetic or the engineer's design approach. These three are linked and here I map one on top of the other. So I'll ask you again, where has failure occurred? Please type your answers. Where has failure or has failure not occurred? Please type your answers. Nobody's typing. Can everybody hear me? Am I, am I lecturing to the board? 32 kilonewtons, excellent. So here's somebody answering, hang on, let me read. 32 kilonewtons, 50 kilonewtons, all right. 70 kilonewtons, 32, 32. Beam hasn't failed. We understand the load behavior of the beam. We do. I just said we do not understand the behavior of the load. That, they are, it obeys the laws of physics. I hope that, these, <laughs> that this presentation puts a nail in that coffin, that we do not understand the real behavior of the beam. We are designers. We are not physicists. Beam hasn't failed, we understand the load behavior of the beam, where the steel yielded. How do I know where the steel yielded? Ultimate limit state, somebody maintained 75 kilonewtons, ration failure at 52 kilonewtons, no collapse though. According to the code, it's 32 kilonewtons, but real life is 74. Once plastic inflammation occurs without increase in load, flexure failure occurs at the point where the deflection keeps climbing, but the load, oh, from the design point of view, 32 kilonewtons. All right, serviceability limit state. So to answer the question, it's a difficult question and it's incredibly dif difficult answer. To answer the question, I'm gonna to attempt to answer it as follows. From a design perspective, the design has passed. It has passed rational design. It has passed rational design. Of course it has passed rational design because we design according to the code and it has past rational design. It, it doesn't depend on the usage. Somebody says it will depend on the usage. It has passed rational design. So from the engineering perspective, structural engineering perspective, we can put a tick. It has passed rational design. Now, where has it failed? The question is failed according to what? Failed for ultimate limit state or failed for serviceability limit state? In this case, there are two serviceability limit states. One is deflection, and the second is cracking. Are there any cracks that appear on the tensile phase? So there are two serviceability limit state failures that we have to investigate. From a structural perspective, 
from a structural perspective so far we can say rational design has held and it has not failed that is good but if we were to be asked exactly where this beam has failed we have to say serviceability limits sorry ultimate limit state failure which is round here and serviceability limit state failure means what deflection is acceptable to us and to the client and what where is the first crack well the first crack has appeared we don't know so guess what i'm going to now show you where the first crack has appeared the first flexural crack appears sorry let me remove that it appeared here and here is the load where it first appeared. Now, this photograph was taken here. Can you see that the deflections are relatively still small, although now it's noticeable, but the deflection here is on the order of really 12 millimeters. So the first flexural crack has occurred here. This photograph corresponds to its yield point, to its yield point. So what we can say to repeat is that from a rational design point of view, in other words, this is all missing. We just know this value, this value, and we have reinforced it thus. We notice that we are a okay for rational design. So rational design, no failure. But if we were to investigate the beam under load, we can say that there are two groups of failure, serviceability failure, which is where the first crack occurs, and where our displacement is beyond acceptable. And that is up to us as the engineers to accept. Somebody wrote uh, L over 250, or the client might state it is L over 500, or you can choose any other value. And the second one is the cracking. So this is relatively, relatively complicated. Now, let's continue with the question, but it works, sorry, but it works, strength consideration. So I think you have been, um, uh, let's use the word educated, if I may use that word, what is failure and what is not. Clearly, there's no mention of collapse. There's been no collapse. There is no collapse. Clearly, the beam is still, you know, intact. Now, let me ask a little bit more of a complicated question. If I were to load this beam up, now this beam clearly has failed from a serviceability. So now forget about, forget about our design and our rational design. We're looking at reality. We're looking at reality, or as best picture of reality as we have. Here is our first crack. Here is this picture. We have loaded, unloaded it. What would happen if we were to reload this beam? Can anybody type up on the chat what would happen? Would it take any load? Where would it come? Where would what would happen? Can anybody tell me? Can anybody type it up? Can yeah, nobody's typing? Nobody knows. If I were to now reload this, all right. Let's show you. Oh, somebody's typing. It will take load but deflection will happen at an accelerated rate. Don't know, that's the honest answer by somebody. About 70 kilometers, follow the second arm back up to where? It will take load, potentially lead to collapse. Ah, so the question is, if I were to load this in a second cycle, the question is, will I attain serviceability limit state loads, ultimate limit state loads beyond, below? Please tell me, start at 10 millimeters and follow the same curve to where? To where? I wanna know how much load it will take. Does it work? Is it working? Is it working? All right, here's the answer. Unfortunately, most of you got it wrong. So here are the cracks to show you. There's a lot of crushing. Can you see the crushing? There's cracking here. Remember, we've got balance reinforcement in here. Now let's look at the second, second, um, second load cycle. Oh, look at that. I asked, so this photograph was taken here. This photograph was taken here. So if you study this, I'll ask you, has this failed? Has this been failed now? This is the second load. Has it failed? Could you type up your answers? Let's see if I'm doing a good job at communicating my thoughts. Has this been failed on the second cycle? So after we have loaded it well past 
It has failed from a serviceability and an ultimate limit state. And then we have unloaded it. Question is, just before we start loading, we are now progressing up. Has this beam failed? What's the answer? Start at 10 and follow up due to cracking. Failure in serviceability due to the superimposed deflection between load and stuff. Only serviceability failure. Passes rational design. Need to be checked for serviceability against prescribed limits. Right. Unfortunately, every single person is incorrect. The structure has failed. It has failed as soon as we have exceeded this point. It doesn't mean that it will collapse. We are still confusing serviceability and collapse. Serviceability must, sorry, failure and collapse, failure and collapse. This has failed, it has not collapsed. This has failed already before it started loading. How do we know? Because there are cracks, because it has reached this point, even though it meets the design criteria still, it has failed in reality. It has failed in reality. Question, but it works. Does it really work? The answer is no, it does not work. It has failed. It has failed as soon as we are at this point, at this point. And the fact that we've unloaded it and reloaded it, and it still maintains the synthetic or the rational design values is irrelevant, is irrelevant. The structure has failed on all planes, both serviceability and ultimate limit state. Let's continue and see what you make of the following slide. It has not collapsed. All right, so this is the summary of what has happened, but this is for the, sorry, let's look now at under-reinforced, under-reinforced. So now we have a beam that instead of following all the reba prescription of the code, same loading, we now decided to save the client some money and we have put less reba. Instead of putting Y12s, we've put in Y10s. All right, we've put in Y10s, we load it up, it passes serviceability limit state. Look where the first crack occurs. The first crack occurs below the service. So this is clearly a failure and it's a failure in rational design because a first crack is below serviceability limit state. It then goes into yield at this point, at this point and does not reach our ultimate limit state um, forces. Now, if we were to progress this, I'm sure it will eventually perhaps asymptotically reach this point, but it is not reaching it on the first elastic loading. So the structure has failed at this point from both a serviceability limit state, from a cracking point of view, from a deflection point of view, and the fact that the ultimate limit state cannot be attained. So remember, these values are synthetic and are set by the engineer, and we work backwards. If we were to unload it and then reload it, the load curve still picks up significantly, almost the same as the first case. Why is that the case? The case is because the steel is yielding and it has been yielding here and it continues to yield here merrily along. So this has failed, if you ask me, where has it failed? Right here. It has failed at the inception stage, at the rational design stage. It has failed before we even loaded it. Before we even loaded it, the structure has failed. Right. Notice, again, I repeat, the first cycle, the second cycle, if I were to give you the second cycle in isolation, you would not know the difference between the first two. This would be a statistical scatter, which is irrelevant. The take home message here is we cannot see failure. We cannot tell if it has failed. We can tell if it has failed rational design by doing a design and checking it against the code. That's the only way. By actually looking at the structure, you can't say if it has failed or not. Clearly, if there are cracks that are visible, it has failed. But if it is in pristine condition, we don't know if it has failed. So the concept of, but it works, clearly everybody can see it, is a false concept. And it's a dangerous concept. Right, no collapse there either. Now, let me perhaps upset some people and look at the last case, and that is of under-reinforcing shear. So we, here we provided enough 
tensile reinforcement for bending, but clearly violated the tensile, sorry, the shear requirements from the code. So this too, this case, before it was loaded, you come out to site and they'll tell you, but it works. And I'll tell them, how do you know? The answer in this case, it has failed at the design stage, at inception. If I were to load this, I would see that this is my force deflection graph. And you must probably were lectured at university level that this is an extremely dangerous um, situation where you under reinforce for shear. It will lead to sudden collapse and other calamities. And this is a big no no. Well, look at our force deflection graph. Our force deflection graph shows that we have surpassed the serviceability limit state on our first swing. We have surpassed our ultimate limit state on the first swing and first loading, and still it continues to climb and still it continues to climb and then whoop, it goes down. Yes, suddenly, but not that suddenly to zero, not that suddenly to zero. This is then our unloading curve. So where does the first shear crack appear here? Where does the first, does it appear here, here or here? Let me show you where the first appears. The first crack that was actually um, uh, appears was a shear crack that appeared here. Can you see? That's where the photograph was taken. It appeared well above our ultimate limit stage shear requirement from the code. And you can say, huh, that's very odd. I would have expected because it's under reinforced to appear here or here. And my answer is no. The code is extremely conservative and concerned about shear. And that for that reason, the first shear crack, they want to drive up as high up the curve as possible. Again, this has failed at inception, at the design inception, at the design rationale. It has failed the design rationale. It has failed design rationale and therefore it has failed at this point. There is no way for us to tell because we don't have x-ray eyes. We don't know what is inside the structure. And then when we load it, so this is a big no-no. When we load it, it takes load merrily. It surpasses its shear. It surpasses its ultimate limit shear uh, requirements and then cracks here. Now the question I have for you, if I were to reload this in a second sequence, in a second load cycle, can you tell me by uh, typing where we will get to, where we will get to? Anybody? Yes, somebody asked. And the reload? Ah, somebody wants to capture, catch me up. And the reload? What will happen upon the reload of the second cycle? Anybody? Must be zero, right? All right. I've been warned I'm running out of time again. So let me show you the second cycle. How much load can the beam take now? You'll be surprised by the answer. This much. Wow. It has gone again and surpassed the serviceability limit state requirement. And it has started to fail at this point. Of course, rationally designed, it has failed right at inception. It has actually failed from a serviceability limit state here and from a deflection point of view, wherever you want to judge. And the ultimate is here. And there is, I would say, very little difference between the second load and the first load cycle. All right, so now no collapse again. So as we said, the three beams were impossible to tell which has failed, which has not, without knowing what's inside the beam and without doing experiments. We have not got a luxury to determine what works and what does not work just because it is up in the sky and it has not collapsed. Right, so let me finish off as follows. Structural collapse is obvious. Failure is defined by the client of the structural engineer. I think I've uh, banged on that drum for long enough and it has to be defined beforehand, a priori. There are many types of failures. We've only touched on a few. Structural failure is not obvious and we cannot tell by simple inspection. If structure does not pass rational design, it could be considered that it has failed upon inception. The statement, which I'm gonna write a uh, paper on, but it works is a fallacy. We don't know if it works. The structure might be unloaded or underloaded. 
And how do we know, how does the observer know that it has failed? Rational design should lead to structures that hold up, stand up, and um, pass, in other words, do not fail. Root cause of structural failure cannot be determined using the building code standards. And structural engineers are not trained to do forensics and failure analysis. 